Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Dave Deptula, the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Power Studies. And I'd like to thank the commander of Air Force Materiel Command, General Arnie Bunch, for joining us today. Uh, AFMC, as uh, I'm sure most all of you know, is a crucial center of gravity in the Air Force. With a large number of modernization programs underway, challenges involved with sustaining a geriatric aircraft inventory, and an imperative to harness key new technology areas. General Bunch has a lot on his plate. However, having known Arnie for many years and seen him in action, I'm confident he's the right leader to successfully tackle these challenges. So we're very fortunate to have him at the helm of Air Force Materiel Command. Um, with that, General Bunch, I'd like to turn it over to you to share with us uh, just what issues are at the top of your uh, priority list these days. So, uh, over to you. So Dave, thank you for the uh, nice words. Uh, my wife wouldn't know who you were talking about having said all those nice things about me. I am, uh, first let me start with saying thank you to you and to the Mitchell Institute for allowing me the opportunity. We tried to do this during my tenure at AQ and for some reason it never worked out. So I'm really glad that I get to do it today. And I'm really glad we've got so many of our industry partners on the line. Uh, this is a team sport. Uh, we have built the world's greatest air force and only we together can sustain that and drive it into the future so that we get to the air force we need and we can support the national defense strategy. Uh, it is really an honor for me to get the opportunity to lead Air Force Material Command. Uh, I, I'm very vocal about that we do our wartime mission each and every day. It ties into me those things that you led into about the importance of it. And I really believe that we're the most important major command in the Air Force that we're going to achieve the national defense strategy and if we're going to uh, drive to the Air Force we need. So I appreciate the time and I look forward to the dialogue and the discussion. A uh, couple things that right now are quite honestly very right on the radar screen that we got to work. The first of those is our return to full capacity. Um, as you know, with COVID-19, we had a we put a lot of folks into telework. We put a lot of our sustainment enterprise in weather and safety leave, and we have really had to adjust and adapt how we've been doing business. Uh, our command is not the same as all the other commands. Uh, when we started into this uh, pandemic, a lot of people talked about how we had a young workforce, physically fit workforce, and what they were really focused on was our uniformed airmen. For this command, over three-fourths of it, not even including our contractors that support us, uh, is non-uniform. And trying to create the environment for them to get back into the workplace where needed, create the capacity to do telework and everything else, uh, that's been a big driver and continues to be a big focus. I just came back from Tinker yesterday looking at how we were standing up the logistics complex so that we could do the sustainment mission. So, so ours is a different workforce and uh, one of our main focuses right now is really on the return to full capacity and how are we going to continue to operate in the face of this pandemic. Uh, the other one that I would say is very much a focal point right now is diversity and inclusion. And how do we create the right work and workplace environment so that all airmen have the opportunity to contribute to their full capacity and create that work environment and keep it going forward. Uh, another one that we have not lost focus on, which actually ties us quite a bit back into our uh, AFM's end of the return to full capacity and operate in the COVID environment is the Air Force material command we need. Uh, that identified IT challenges, which with COVID, we've opened the bandwidth. We've allowed people to do some things differently, and it's allowed us to do some things that we wouldn't have done in the past. Uh, it's also tied into how we lead. Uh, a lot of the feedback I got when I first got in was that we didn't have first level supervisors that were leading the way we needed to and we needed to do a better job of training them and we're focused on that. Uh, our facilities are ones we continue to focus on and how we do our hiring for the future. So, return to full capacity, diversity and inclusion, Air Force material command we need, 
Another big focus that we'll probably go into a little bit later is our Science and Technology 2030. Uh, that's been a big driver for what we're trying to change with how we're doing our managing our s and portfolio and making sure that we can uh, be ready for that high-end fight and make sure we're getting the technology out into the field at speed of relevance. And the last one that I think is very important, and, and we have multiple others, but I'll limit it to this, is our digital campaign. Uh, we kicked off a digital campaign to look at how we do roll digital capabilities into everything that we do from science and technology initiation all the way through the sustainment of platforms so that we're focused on all those. So uh, a lot of activities going on and I'm really looking forward to the dialogue. Those are just some of the top level things that we're focused on, Dave. Well, thanks for that uh, great uh, overview, uh, General Bunch. Let's, uh, let's uh, jump in a little bit uh, deeper. Um, you recently commented, uh, quote, when I took command of AFMC, I thought I understood the command since I was part of it since it was started in 1992. I spent most of my career in it. What I learned is that there's so much more that goes on that I needed to understand more deeply, unquote. Could you elaborate a little bit on that statement? Where, where did you uh, uh, find uh, that you had a learning curve and uh, what discoveries did you find most surprising? Yeah, so, so uh, Dave, I was really uh, pleased to get the, the honored again to get the opportunity to, to do something we never thought we'd be able to do, which was be the uh, command team here. I, when I came in, I could have easily said, hey, I got it all, I understand it all. But what I needed to do was, as Joel Golfe talks about, I needed to squint with my ears. And I needed to hear from some of our airmen as to what our challenges were and what we needed to be focused on. And that was what the genesis of the AFMC we need was. And I got over 80,000 comments from airmen being very specific about areas that we need to go work on. And that's kind of shaped a lot of what we've needed to start. How do we improve the facilities? How do we improve uh, how we're uh, doing our leadership? How are we doing our hiring? Those are ones that we've already started efforts on and we got out into. The other one that I quite honestly didn't fully comprehend and understand was just how extensive the sustainment center mission was to manage that legacy fleet, as you talked about earlier, and manage the supply chain. And what are the implications on a working capital fund? And what does it mean when we don't fly a flying air program that we've been trying to fly for a period of time? All of those are ones right now now that uh, I've had to focus on and learn a whole lot more about. I'm still not at the PhD level of many of the experts that we have in the command, but I do feel that I'm much more uh, well-versed and able to talk to my fellow MAGCOM commanders a lot of all, about a lot of those areas. The other one that was not really part of the command when I was one of the first five center commanders we had when we went to the new construct was the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center how we provide that foundational support to take care of airmen and their families across the entire Air Force enterprise at all of the installations, that's been one that I've had to get myself much more well-versed on. I've learned a lot about privatized housing. I've learned a lot about PFOS, PFOA. I've learned a lot about MILCON. I've learned a lot about child development centers, food 2.0, Category management for doing contracts. Those are ones that I was not as aware of when I came into the command, but I've learned a whole lot more about. Uh, I understood the test business reasonably well. I understood what was going on in the acquisition programs. I understood the s and having been a research lab director once upon a time. Uh, but those were areas that I'd heard about, I thought I sort of knew, but I definitely wasn't as aware or well-versed as I needed to be when I came into the job and I've learned a great deal about. Well, thanks for those uh, insights. Uh, let's talk about the future a little bit. I mean, success in that future uh, is going to depend on effectively gathering, processing, and sharing information. A JAD C2 and ABMS are leading constructs uh, in this regard. Uh, AFMC was established in an era when the Air Force secured desired results via industrial age hardware. Um, how's your command evolving to deal with the information age? And if, if you were to look at AFMC in 10 years, 
Where do you anticipate we'd see the uh, biggest changes to manifest uh, your vision? Yeah, so Dave, that's a great question and one that we are focused on and worried, and worried is not the right word, uh, focused on how do we develop our workforce to be at that, ready to go into that digital era. You know, I talked about the digital campaign. Uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need to be able to support doing digital campaign and sharing the data that we collect in the lab with the data that we collect in flight tests and how do we put all that on contract and how do we create a feedback loop so that we can speed that process up and how do we capitalize on that digital replication so that we can move technology into the field faster. Uh, I think that's an area that we've really got. I'm really proud of the work the team's doing on the digital campaign with the efforts. And it's not just looking at what do I have to have for the IT. We're also looking at what do I need out of the airmen? How do I have to train them? How do I get them to handle the data? How do I get them to be able to analyze in that manner and share? And how do we do that with industry? Uh, the 30th of July, we're having our virtual industry day uh, where we're talking about our digital campaign. We've done some initial dialogues in with the industry, uh, but the digital campaign, the way we're looking at that, it's got members of the research lab, it's got members of the test community, it's got members of the Life Cycle Management Center, the Sustainment Center, we're also included the Space and Missile Systems Center in so that we can all learn together and do this digital environment so that we can move things at a faster pace. So I think that's one where we know we need to go that way. We're trying to develop the workforce, set us up for the future, and I believe that's gonna be one area that's gonna be really critical. Another area is going to be software. Uh, you know, we've got our software engineering groups that are at all the logistics complexes. We've set up Kessel Run. We've got Bespin. We've got Level Up. I know that Lieutenant General J.T. Thompson's got the Kobayashi Maru. We're looking at how do we integrate and work software into this so that we're moving at a more rapid pace and more along the lines of what commercial does and how do we roll the testing into that earlier? How do we make sure we're cooking in the cyber security as we start? All of those are areas that I would say we're looking at how do we push that technology forward. Um, open mission systems, you know, uh, the B-21, the GB, uh, ground-based strategic deterrent, those are open mission system things so that we can move technology in as technology speeds forward. How do we bring two new technologies in and integrate them so that we don't have to go through a three-year uh, software cycle to do a mod. How do I bring something in and because I've got the interface right, I can do that in a more rapid manner. Um, Kubernetes, there's a lot of promise there. We're right now trying to put Kubernetes into F16 software and see how that evolves. Uh, I was just out at Hollum and looking at that and we're looking at how can we do that in a T38 so that we can test systems more rapidly and just test the module that we're trying to work and not worry about the whole thing. So those are ones that you would immediately look back at and you go, okay, that's acquisition, that's moving technology forward. But there's some other ones there that not everybody thinks about. So like robotics. Uh, we're doing laser deep paint with a robotics where we're putting in so that we can do that and it's more environmentally friendly. It's easier on our workforce so they're not having to put all the piece, uh, personal protection equipment on and go into that and trying to be greener. And how do we do that in a manner that we can expand that out? How do we do things like cold spray to repair? That, those are things that not everybody thinks about when you look about going forward, but in this command, we got to think about those kind of things and how do we move those out? Uh, how do we do more additive manufacturing? How do we do 3D printing? Reverse engineering for legacy components so that we can move that out into the field quicker. How do we take uh, conditions-based maintenance? How do we use some of those capabilities and get that to where we're doing our maintenance when we want to, not when we have to? Uh, and then last one that I'll touch here, and we can go into this in more detail if you want. How do I bring artificial intelligence into my supply chain management so that we realize where our roadblocks are? And how do we look at, or like COVID, where are the hotspots? 
How is that going to impact the supply chain? How do I analyze that? And what steps can I take to get after that to make sure I have the capability in the field? Those are all things that I think are going to be critical for us to look at as we look at what does this command need to look like in the future? I think the structure is good right now, Dave. I don't see that as a major change. But I think the integration of all those centers together so that we're sharing that information and making uh, the right decisions as we start the acquisition programs and as we're sustaining the acquisition programs, I think those are going to be the things that we have to look at as we go forward. Well, that's very good. Thanks for that uh, insight. Um, it, 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 it really does uh, illustrate uh, just what you are doing uh, in moving from the information age, uh, or I'm sorry, moving from the industrial age into the information age. Now, Dr. Roper and uh, other Air Force leaders have prioritized diversifying the defense industrial base with new actors uh, to gain access to new ideas and talent. Uh, this kind of gets on to what you just said, but kind of shifts it in a bit of a different direction. Uh, could you talk a bit about how uh, AFMC is modernizing its approach to dealing with new talent um, such that they're actually motivated to engage with the Air Force? And, and what are some of the challenges involved with uh, partnering with these uh, new uh, sectors and uh, partners? Yeah, and, and every challenge and opportunity as Joe Goldfein talks about. So there are some things that are a little bit different with how we interact with people. Uh, but it's also very promising and very energizing when you get some of these highly motivated teams that are coming to the table for the first time. You know, I, I, we're training our, our airmen on how to use some of these additional contracting authorities. We're training them on how to interact. We're training them on how to talk through intellectual property rights with the companies that are coming forward. Uh, we recently, AFWorks has realigned under our Air Force Research Laboratory, and we're working to look at how we do those pitch days and how do we keep that progress that Dr. Roper and everyone has made uh, going forward. For us, the big thing is we've got to uh, educate and communicate. We've got to educate our people on what's there and uh, what they can do to bring some of those new technologies on board, how to capitalize on the pitch days how some of that technology can come in and work. And we got to communicate with these companies to let them know kind of what we expect, how we expect to do business. And we got to let communication is a two way street. We got to talk about what we expect, but we also got to listen to what the impediments are that we're creating. And then if those impediments are ones that we need to go work, then that's where we, I as a four star commander can roll in and go, Hey, we need to work, to try to alleviate some of these things. You know, one of the areas that I've been a big proponent of looking at for quite a while, particularly when it gets into the cyber and the IT world, I've been a huge proponent for colorless money. You know, I've never been able to really look at an IT or a cyber program and clearly delineate where I go from development to procurement to sustainment because those lines all blur and it's constantly changing. So I think those are ones that we need to continue to look at where those limitations are. And there are things that we need to work with the uh, leaders who control the color of money and look at those rules and regulations to see what can we do so that we are moving at speed of relevancy. How can I increase my throughput? How can I get to where I don't have to go get an above threshold reprogramming every time I want to go do something? Uh, so those are areas that I think we have to continue to work. Uh, there are things, though, that we're going to have to, we will have to continue to work. I mean, we need a certain level of confidence that systems are going to work. Usually that's done through testing. How we test is different than how some uh, commercial industry tests. There are things we need to learn from that. There are some things we may need them to work with us on so that we understand what data are we getting in and why does it work. Not just I push the I believe button that it does work. And that's going to be a give and a take that we have to look at. And a lot of that's going to depend on what area are we talking about. Am I talking about a business system or am I talking about a nuclear uh, intercontinental ballistic missile? I don't see those as the same. Uh, we need to be innovative in all those areas, but one of them is a fail-safe area that we'll need to do more rigor in. The other one, I may be able to take some risk and let things happen. And I think that's the communication piece that we have to continue to work as well. 
Now, that's very good. Now, um, where is this uh, credit card swiper I keep hearing about from uh, top officials? And uh, how, how do I swipe Mitchell Institute's card into it? Well, I can tell you that when we got to where we were doing GPC contracts in as little as 15 minutes, we definitely shook some folks up. And I, I praise uh, Dr. Roper and uh, Cameron Holt were the genesis of that. That started when I was the military deputy at AQ. And what I would say is the whole contracting team, professionals, leaned into it and found a way to get to yes. And uh, it's been remarkable how that's changed to be able to get industry partners who can come in and immediately get money to go forward. I mean, Dave, one of the things we talked about in growing this industrial base, we have to realize that we're not the only ones watching our industrial base and looking at the ideas they're coming forward with. I have had companies come to me after pitch days and say they had companies from outside the United States who wanted to buy their intellectual property, but because we could get them on contract in a rapid manner, they were able to avoid that, they were able to stay solvent, and they were able to move forward. And that partnership with Venture to see where we were investing, it creates more of an industrial base and it protects that industrial base from outside investments. And that's another factor that we've got to take into account as we move forward. Well. Speaking of industrial base, it's no secret that the Air Force is operating the smallest and oldest force in its history. Um, this certainly portends sustainment challenges for uh, your command. Um, where are you seeing the most significant issues, Arnie? And uh, at what point do you determine when certain airframes are just simply too worn out to remain in service? Yeah, and, and Dave, that's a great question. And, and the image I would give, ask everybody out there that's listening in, uh, you can go look up the average age of our inventory, and you've heard us talk about before how most of it is eligible for an antique tag if it was a car. Think about if the traffic in D.C. was operating an inventory that was old, as old as ours was, what, what rush hour would be like every day? Uh, and we're executing around the world as the world's greatest air force in spite of that. So I just give you that as an image to put in your brain as to the miracle workers that are sustainment engineers and our airmen working at the depots and the program officers are to keep this aged, uh, I won't call it old, uh, the words Joe Wolfenbarger encouraged me to use when I talked about uh, workforce at times was seasoned. Our seasoned inventory of aircraft, just how much of miracle workers these people really are. Um, and a lot of it, Dave, I really believe gets down into the quality of the data that we're putting into our systems and why I think data quality, managing our data is really important. You know, we have a very, a very active aircraft structural integrity program. And that's why we have confidence when we say it's okay to go fly that B-52 out to 2040. Or, or here are the risks associated with flying this B-1. It's also what led us to the point that we said we're not going to be able to keep the F-15C fleet as long as many people originally thought. Uh, we've got issues in the longerons. We've got issues in the wing. The longerons were working. The wings, that's just going to be not be cost effective to go do the replacement of the wings and why we want to invest in the F-15EX and why it's so important that we keep the F-35 program going forward. So I think how we, how we manage those data and how we look at that, those type of things and the integrity of our aircraft structural integrity program and that engineering rigor to make our airmen feel safe to go strap on these air vehicles and go put them in harm's way, that's why it's really critical that we have that integrity. Um, we have made tremendous strides in our corrosion programs and trying to get at that. Uh, and I'm very proud of our airmen in doing that. I'm very proud of what they do to keep the structural integrity going and how we work together to make that happen. But it takes that kind of rigor and that kind of attention to detail and those professionals to actually support and to make that happen. Oh, very good. The Air Force is also comprised of a numerous small high demand aircraft inventories like the F-22 and the B-2. 
Uh, it is often portend high sustainment costs because inventories originally designed to be large ended up small um, with expenses unable to be amortized across a broad inventory. How do these experiences uh, uh, shape your attitude when it comes to buying a new program like the B21 and the need to buy uh, large numbers? Yeah, so Dave, that's a, a having been in the B2 program at its early stages and watching it go down to that small number, uh, it still pains me that we're at the number that we are at today and it definitely created supply and demand issues within the vendor base. Uh, and it's one that we have to learn those lessons. For the B21, I think Joel Ray has done a very good job of explaining the critical mission need for why we have to have a larger force and why it's so important to our nation's defense and our deterrent capabilities to have that larger inventory. If I step back from that and I look at the sustainment part of that, if I go out to our industrial base and I want to buy 20 or 40 of something, that's a whole different calculus than if I want to buy 100,000 or 200,000 or even 200 or 400 of a run of something. And so those are the, the, that has to factor into our calculus of how we move forward. And the other thing that I think the B21, I think is a great example. If I'm a vendor out there and I look at how we set up the open mission system architecture, how we're making some of our decisions to retain those aircraft for a long period of time, because I'm going to bring new technologies in, but some of those underlying things that are going to sustain it for the long term are going to be there for a long period of time, then it makes it more lucrative and it makes it one that I'm more willing to invest in. So it is critical that we keep the numbers up. You know, it's just for those small fleets, it is really hard to get a vendor base to be willing to make those kind of investments and sustain that capability for the longer period of time. And, and it's one we're really going to have to watch. Well, I certainly hope um, as defense budgets come under greater and greater uh, pressure for a variety of reasons, not to mention COVID-19, um, that the leadership of the nation doesn't go down the same road and make the same mistakes that it did in cutting the B-2 force from 132 military requirement down to 21. So I'm looking forward to that uh, 180 B-21s being built. Um, now, a uh, little bit uh, related but separate subject. Um, when he was still serving as Secretary of Defense, uh, Jim Mattis set an 80% readiness goal for much of the Air Force's fighter force. And that was a requirement that applied to the Navy and the Marine Corps too. What did you learn from the experience of trying to meet this target? Yeah, so the MC-80 uh, mission capability rate of 80 definitely uh, uh, caused us to take some different actions than we'd originally planned, and we definitely learned some lessons out of that. Um, first off, that was really focused because of the way it was going to take us time to implement it on combat coded. So we really focused our investments and our supply efforts in one particular area, and as you know, Dave, that has implications to other parts. Uh, so one of the things we learned out of that is if you focus in one area and you don't have as much focus on the others, you can have second and third order effects. So we got to think our way through that. But the really big lesson that we learned out of that was if we put the money into the system and we tell industry what we want to go do, we can improve that mission capable rate. We saw jumps in the F-16 that we hadn't seen. Uh, and it responded in a lot of different ways. When we put parts on the shelf and we give our airmen the parts to turn and we increase inventory levels, uh, then we can increase our uh, aircraft availability or, or our mission capable rates. On the F-22, we did the very same thing, but that one took more time, but we're seeing the benefits of that now. The investments that we made, because many of those were small vendors, as we talked about earlier, where we didn't have quite the demand signal on the industrial base. And many of those people weren't producing parts at the level that we would need to sustain because of the demand signal with a smaller fleet. We've now seen those aircraft availability and mission capable rates go up and improve. And what I really learned out of that is if we put the money into it, we tell industry what we want to go do, industry is going to respond and they're going to be able to support. Uh, so that was a big lesson learned. Uh, but we have to look at that in the lens of what are we doing across the entire enterprise and think about, okay, if I'm increasing in this, in combat coded, 
what does that do to my training fleet and how do I sustain that? Because sooner or later you have those implications and we just have to be smart about what we go and do. But the clear learning lesson was if we tell the industry what we're doing, we put the money in it, we're going to be able to generate aircraft. Very good. Let's switch domains uh, for a bit, uh, Arnie, and uh, take a look at the, the Space Force. With its uh, stand-up, uh, how do you foresee the role of a senior acquisition executive evolving? Uh, should there be separate SAEs for the Space Force and the Air Force, or should this be a role combined under the Department of the Air Force? Yeah, so Dave, I'm not going to be able to give you a really great answer on that one. I know we're doing a study of that right now. There are views on both sides of how this plays out. Uh, our, what we're focused on right now is how do we support General Raymond and his stand-up and, and what we want to make sure we do, however that plays out. We want to make sure that we don't artificially create barriers that preclude technology from flowing to the air, cyber, or space forces. So I will let the study play out. We'll support whatever they do. All I'm really focused on right now and what we've talked about at the MAGCOM commander level with General Raymond and his team is let's just make sure we don't create artificial barriers here so that what we're doing in space can end up being used in the air. And let's make sure we're using those technologies across for the benefit of everybody. No, I think that's great insight, Arnie, and thank you. I understand the sensitivity to the other part, but that uh, you, I think your point on not uh, building, creating additional barriers is an extremely good one. Um, here's one that's just a little bit, uh, maybe not as uh, politically sensitive, but uh, still uh, valid. Um, which parts of the Air Force acquisition organization do you see migrating to the Space Force? And are there any organizations that will remain with the Air Force, but be given acquisition authorities for the Space Force as well? Let me let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And that might be the various directorates within uh, the Air Force mm -hmm. Research Laboratories. Um, besides having a space vehicles directorate, um, there are other directorates that have always benefited space in the past, um, such as the sensors, materiel, and uh, directed energy directorates, just to name a few. Um, the Space Force will still use all those or need all those capabilities. And we can assume, they can't just, uh, I don't think we want to assume um, they can't just duplicate those directorates. So what's the right combination to give both the Air Force and the Space Force the capabilities they both need? Yeah, so, so Dave, that's a great question. And, uh, and, and I'll give you a couple different examples as to how we're looking at it within the command right now. And I'll start with AFRL because that's where you were. There are certain directorates that are going to have uniform Space Force individuals in them. Uh, they are going to be executing programs that are going to be priority for the Space Force. The way that we see it right now is it's all going to be under the Air Force Research Laboratory executing for the Department of the Air Force. So we will get priorities as to what General Raymond and his team want us to be doing with S&T dollars. But what we again want to do is not limit where they, where the Space Force can get the technology in from, nor how the, the other parts of the Air Force, Department of the Air Force, can use those things that are developed maybe within the Space Vehicles Directorate, or certain parts of the Sensors Directorate that are going to be part of the Space Force. So what we want to make sure is we don't create barriers or cylinders of excellence. The reality of it is technology doesn't know its application until you tell it. So we need to make sure that we don't inhibit that flow of that technology back and forth, but that we don't lose track of we are executing priorities that Joel Raymond and his team have that are critical. The whole S&T 2030 development, I, from the very beginning, I've given the team direction that it cannot exclude or not think about how we're going to operate with the Space Force. So we have got to make sure that we're looking after their interests. We're investing in the, in the key areas that they believe they have gaps. But by the same token, I can't allow things that, they, that I'm doing in other parts. I can't create a barrier that not, does not allow them to flow over into Space Force U. For example, one of the teams that won a big award for us last year within our enterprise was, was specifically supporting 
space and how they did command and control. That team was at Rome, New York, in the information directorate. That, they are none that right now is being looked at as monies that are being segregated off for the Space Force. They are not one that's going to roll into being part of the Space Force, but they're doing key command and control and communication and cybersecurity work that the Space Force can capitalize on and benefit from, and I want to make sure that we don't create an environment where we don't allow that to happen. Same with the munitions directory. There are things where you care, if it's an offensive and defensive space, one of the things the munitions director does a very good job is, is looking at how effective was a weapon, what are the, was it a kill, was it not a kill, what were the probabilities, how did it work? Those are things that we can flow over. Materials, you touched on that. There are materials we're going to direct, uh, design and work on here that are going to support F-22. There are also things that we may be able to capitalize on and use them on satellites. So for AFRL, that's our big drive right now. Let's don't lose the synergy of having one Air Force Research Laboratory. Let's be cognizant of that the Space Force has its priorities. But let's make sure that we don't stove pipe it up so those technologies can't go forward. The other one that I would talk about is the test enterprise. So I don't want to go, I, I hope that we don't get into a situation where we try to replicate capabilities that we already have at Arnold or at Edwards or at Eglin or all the other places that we do uh, test work over 25 or 30 locations around the United States. We just need to make sure we're prioritizing that in with the other work that we're doing. General Lozano, who is our test center commander, is having a very good rapport with uh, Lieutenant General J.T. Thompson, Stephen Whiting, John Shaw, they're having all those discussions now as to how that test enterprise works and how do we do that synergistically to make sure that we don't have to replicate. And the last one that's probably not on everybody's radar screen is, how am I going to do installation and mission support? The Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center is still going to provide that support for those Space Force bases. And we got to make sure that we're thinking our way through how we're doing all that so that we make sure we're taking care of airmen and our space professionals and their families all at the same time. Boy, Arnie, those are some great insights. And I think they also speak to the wisdom of having both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force come under the purview of the Department of the Air Force so that we don't let organizational segregation get in the way of the integration that's so important when it comes uh, to research and as you raised uh, very appropriately uh, testing uh, you know I, I don't know how many people are familiar with what actually has occurred down at uh, Arnold Air Force Base uh, over these many many years but they have been key absolutely key in allowing us to succeed in our space uh, endeavors to date so uh, some some really excellent points there on both the, the Air Force Research Lab and the, the testing enterprise. Um, before we uh, move to our uh, audience Q&A, let me, let me hit you up with uh, one more uh, uh, question. Uh, and that has to do with the uh, upcoming budgets. Um, I think you're aware, and most people are growingly aware that uh, the department's gonna come under some pressure given the COVID-19 funding uh, demands. Um, a drop in funding, however, uh, simply doesn't correspond to your actual mission demand. In fact, it may get worse if things like new aircraft acquisitions slow down, spare parts inventories decline. So how do you explain these challenges when you're uh, talking to members of Congress and uh, other key stakeholders? Yeah, so Dave, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, point. And, and if we do take uh, if the budget flattens or it does things and we start looking at those, the main thing that I want to make sure of is I just want to make sure that all parts of the equation are considered. You know, when you say I'm going to retain a certain platform, then you need to understand what that drives from a sustainment cost. And that means these modernization programs have to take place so that we can sustain that. And we have to re-wing or we have to go get these components and we have to do a form fit function replacement of these components. And even when we do that, it still might not be as capable as we need to address the challenges of tomorrow. 
here's what it does to your workforce. You know, I was going to be able to do this with 10 people. Now, because it's a legacy thing and it's not as good as many uh, data things or computers in it, then I may not be able to apply some of the uh, computer-based technologies or digital things that I had before. Now it's going to take me this many more people. Um, that goes into facilities and everything else that we do, Dave. It ties into everything. And what I really want as the MatchCom commander that ha owns a lot of that sustainment and is really uh, sustainment of not only the inventory of the, of the Air Force and all the platforms and software and all those things, but also the infrastructure of the Air Force. I just want to make sure that we're part of the discussion and we're weighing in all the factors before we make the decisions. Because it has factors on the capabilities, it has factors on the cost, and it has a lot of factors that weigh into our manpower. Uh, you know, in the past, one of the things we've done is we've given up capabilities or uh, platforms and we've taken those people away. And then when those platforms come back, the people don't come back and we end up with more work than we got people and we end up spreading ourselves really thin. And so what we've got to do is we just need to clearly communicate what the ramifications of some of the decisions may be. And then the, the, the people who make those decisions, they're, they're committed to national defense. They're all very passionate about it. We just need to communicate, and then we need to execute the best we can with the resources that we got. Well, very good, General Bunch. We've come to the end of uh, this segment of our uh, discussion. Uh, I want to thank you for your uh, superb uh, insights, uh, and uh, your answers clearly indicate that you're the right person at the right place. Uh, to lead AFMC into the future. So all the best to your and your command success in the future. All right. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. It's been an honor to get to talk with you today. And I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate that uh, you invited me to participate. Okay. As an alert to our uh, listeners, our next event is July 6th, when uh, Mitchell Institute will uh, host Dr. Rob Sufer, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, for nuclear and missile defense policy. Um, we're now gonna open this session to uh, questions from the uh, audience uh, who've been listening to our conversation. Uh, as a reminder to those of you um, who are participating, uh, please use the raise hand function on the app. Uh, and when I call on you, unmute your mic and then please state your name and the affiliation of uh, um, where you are. Uh, but I'm gonna kick this off with a uh, text question from a uh, former general, uh, not former general, he's current general, but he's retired, Ron Keyes. Arnie, can you fill us in on the war tech effort that has been in the news? Purportedly, AFRL, AFWIC operators to vet useful technology that solves real world problems. Who is gonna be in the room and will it actually vet and make recommendations? So, so, Dave, that's a great question, and that's one part of the myriad of things that we've taken off after on S&T 2030. Uh, one of the things that I, we found as we started looking at where we need to go with the research laboratory to get after the advances that we needed to make, we did not feel we had enough uh, warfighter input. We do not have as many operators sitting in the research lab as we once did. So what we are trying to, what we are doing, not trying to do, we formed a merger with AF, with AFWIC, AQR, and we're bringing in additional match comps, and we're getting ideal ideas from AFRL. And what we're taking are, what are the shortfalls and the gaps that people are identifying? We're going out to the tech directorates as well as to others and saying, what can you bring to get at this? And then we're bringing those ideas forward to, to AFWIC, and to get those looked at, and then they will eventually come up to the Capability Development Council that we put in place, which is co-chaired by the Vice Chief and the uh, Under Secretary of the Air Force. The other piece that I've now asked the team to go look at is, who is the Space Force representative of this, so that we can make sure we're putting the appropriate focus on General Raymond's priorities and gaps as well, even while we continue to do the full stand-up of the Space Force. So it is something we're doing. It's We've moved out on it. It's getting good ideas. It's bringing it to the two-star roughly level, and it's taken up to the Capability Development Council so that we're looking at ideas and where we want to place money. 
Okay, very good. Um, how about uh, John Turpak? Good morning, General. Good to talk to you. John Turpak, Air Force Magazine. You talked a little while before about uh, the uh, difficulties of managing a small fleet. Uh, Dr. Roper is uh, uh, doing a cost analysis right now of the, uh, the NGAD program where uh, he might have a fleet of maybe only 50 or 100 airplanes. Maybe you could talk about, uh, first of all, what kind of savings that could create, but also maybe some of the upfront expenses of that and what would be involved in transitioning to that kind of a model where you're maintaining small fleets, but perhaps only for 10 years or so. So, John, that's a great question. That's part of what we're doing in the business case now, doing the, dis the discussions that Dr. Roper and his team are leading. Um, it, it will be different. It's kind of a mindset change for how we've done some of our big fleet acquisitions. Uh, the key thing here is to make sure that we can move at speed of relevance and to get new technologies into it. Uh, one of the key things that I'm, I'm really proud of the way the team's moving out is to get an open mission system architecture and to try to set some of the mission systems as more standards so that we can morph that off. Now, there will be, that, that's a different business case analysis with industry. And that's part of the communication that Dr. Roper has got to lead is to get industry to understand. And it changes some of our cost analysis along the way as well, because what you're incentivizing is the, is the development and not the long-term production or the long-term sustainment. And that's part of the communication that we've got to work, and it's not just communication with the industry, but it's also communication with OSD, with Congress, to get everybody to understand the strategy that we're moving out on and why it's so important to go do and why we believe it's the right way so that we can stay relevant as technology is advancing at such a rapid rate. Sure. Can you can you talk a bit about how moving to this model will will change the uh, AFMC organization? Do you expect to uh, neck down to fewer depots or or have big changes in uh, how you staff the uh, uh, AF, AFMC uh, workforce? Well, so I think one of the things that's going to be a key contributor to this, John, is going to be how we go digital if we're going to move at the right speed. And I talked about that. As I talked about our digital campaign, I think that will be a big influence in how we do our uh, acquisition workforce and, and our test, uh, just the whole spectrum of what we do within the command that's going to be a key player into those areas. I, I don't see us doing this on everything that we do. I think it's going to be very uh, more focused. So I don't see it as having tremendously different changes into how we do our depot workforce initially. We'll have to see how it progresses, but we're still going to have B-52s, KC-135s, KC-46s, B-21s. Those are still going to be things that we're doing that business in the depot, so I don't know the full ramifications of that on that part of the enterprise, John. All right, sir. Thank you. Okay, how about uh, Garrett Rhyme? Uh, yes, this is Garrett with Flight Global. Uh, my question is about the mission capability rate. Um, why was the um, mission, the eighty percent mission capability rate, the wrong way to measure readiness? And um, what is being proposed uh, in its place? And if you could help explain that, it would be helpful. Yeah. So I please do not quote me as saying that mission capable rate was the wrong number. I don't even need a former Secretary of Defense getting upset about that. It was, a, it was a target that we went out there for, and there are a lot of different ways that we look at how we measure readiness. And, and, and what we now have, I have a regular meeting with other MAGCOM commanders on an aircraft availability improvement program. That is our focus on what does the MAGCOM commander that owns those platforms need to be able to do his training, his readiness, all aspects of his mission set, and what do I, as the MAGCOM commander for sustainment and working with Dr. Roper's team and the PEOs, where do we need to be making our investments to improve that aircraft availability? Is it in uh, a certain component that is failing too often? Is it increasing our sustaining engineering dollars so that we can get after some of the problems that they're having? Is it and what we do is, on a regular basis, 
My A4 team works with the MATCHCOM A4 teams and the program executive officers to look at what are our drivers for aircraft availability, what's causing the numbers to go the wrong way, where is the wisest investment that we can make. That is really where our focus is right now, is what can we do with the dollars that we have available to increase aircraft availability. That's there, what we're measuring ourselves against right now. Is there a new benchmark or key performance indicator that you guys now use? Um, how, you know, how, it seems like it could be a bit nebulous if you don't have a, you know, some sort of goal to work towards. So every, well, there's, there are three things we look at. Uh, there is what are we actually getting? There is what is planned, and that is what we are actually funded to. And there is a standard. That standard is what that MATCHCOM commander believes that they would need to be able to do everything that's on their plate. As you can probably imagine, we are not funded usually at the standard rate. We're usually funded at the planned rate. That is almost my contract with the MATCHCOM commanders and Dr. Roper's contract with the MATCHCOM commanders to make sure that we're trying to meet those needs as best we can. There's some trade-offs we have to do there. I do not have enough invested in a lot of the accounts to be able to go at the standard, but we do measure ourselves against what the plan is for the year. Okay, thanks for that question. How about Frank Wolf? Uh, yeah, hi, General Bunch. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the hypersonic uh, development work that's ongoing, uh, you know, the munitions directorate at Eglin, and also just uh, what's what how the integration efforts are going for, uh, I guess, the 7,000 pound uh, AGM 183A on the center line of the F 15EX. So I won't go into all the specific details. What I'll tell you is uh, as we went into COVID, we started prioritizing missions that we needed to keep on track to move out and keep going because there were certain things that based on the limited numbers that I could bring into some of the facilities for test, some of the things that we could limited do in, uh, in the research world and what we were doing, there were certain areas that got a higher priority and we moved forward. What I will tell you is that was high enough priority that we were continuing to do work at Arnold and at Holloman, and at Eglin, and at Edwards to keep it all moving forward. So I, what I really want you to walk away with is the hypersonic efforts are high priority and we're really moving out. Um, all of those are progressing. Arrow right now, I would say, is our leading candidate. Uh, we uh, started Hacksaw and Arrow dual path, we knew that was the intent all along, was that if Aero proceeded normally, that there would be a time that we would go off of Hacksaw because of budget constraints. And we have done that because Aero is proceeding accordingly and doing very well. And so all the efforts are progressing. They're all making great progress. I'm not seeing any issues right now with the integration schedules that we had. And I'm really proud of the way the team has works together with industry, local installations, and at all part and local communities in the COVID environment to continue to execute those programs. Thank you. Uh, one last question, uh, Teresa Hitchens. Thank you. It's nice to see you, General Bunch. Um, thank you for doing this. <clears throat> My question involves the F-16 and your efforts to integrate Kubernetes and, and software development. Can you speak to what your goal is there? What are you trying to get to with that? Well, and I'm, and I'm not the pro from Dover on Kubernetes. So I have the uh, probably, uh, I do not have the PhD in Kubernetes. But Kubernetes, as it is explained to me, is a capability that can containerize and then you can bring other modules in and you can operate them in a secure environment without them interacting with all the other systems that are on board the aircraft. And you can do that in a timely manner and check out a module versus checking out everything in integration together. And they can operate and you can replicate in a more holistic manner what's happening on the ground before you ever get to flight. The goal of this would be to get to the point that we have that secure mechanism to be able to integrate in 
and do updates in a more rapid manner without having to do the full integration of all the components to ensure that it's going to operate seamlessly and not have second and third order effects uh, when you integrate a capability in. For example, when I used to, when Major Bunch was the B1, uh, in the B1 program office, anytime we touched the software, we had to go do multiple regression runs of the B1 terrain following system to make sure that we didn't touch that. If we would have had a way to isolate what we were adding in on, then we would not, we would still probably have done some runs to ensure, and we'd have done lab tests, but we wouldn't have had to have done an extensive of a flight test program, and we could have updated software in a much more rapid manner. That's where we're trying to go so that we can put technology and new software capabilities in at the speed of relevance and address shortfalls at the speed of relevance that our operators are bringing forward. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the end of this Aerospace Nation. And once again, I'd like to extend a most sincere thanks to General Bunch, not just for being here with us today, but for all his dedication and commitment to tackling challenges that'll prove crucial for our airmen and on tomorrow's flight lines. Uh, so to you and uh, our audience uh, from all of us at Mitchell Institute, uh, please have a great aerospace power kind of day. Dave, thanks again. Thanks for everybody that tuned in and I appreciate your time and I appreciate all your support. And uh, I appreciate everything we do in this command doing our wartime mission each and every day. And I get the privilege of working for 87,000 plus airmen and it is a true blessing. So everybody have a great day. Thank you.